Mark Williams, welcome back to the Way Champion podcast, my friend. Yes, thanks very much, John, for the invite once again. Uh-huh. I guess it's been... <laughs> Sorry, did that? Did, did you hear that? My email's coming in? No, I didn't okay. hear it. That, but let's start. Great. Let's start again. Uh, James yeah. will just cut out the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. I think one an email came in and it made a beeping sound. So I yeah. wondered what. That was I didn't hear it. Okay. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I'll tell you I what hurt. I'll do. I'll, I'll close my inbox here so that uh, I don't get disrupted. Okay. Sorry about that. Fire All right. Away. Ready? All right. Here we go. Mark Williams, welcome back to the Way Champions podcast. Yeah. Thanks very much, John. Uh, many thanks for inviting me back. It's it's probably been two or three years, if I remember rightly, since I was it, on last. It is, and I and I think way back then we obviously had an amazing discussion about your work in skill acquisition and learning and everything mm-hmm. that you know you're passionate about. And I think you had the idea at that time that you wanted to write uh, a popular science book, and 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 now it's out. So we're releasing this right around the day that your book gets released in the U.S. It's called "The Best: How Elite Athletes Are Made." So congratulations! Yeah, thank you very much. I hadn't realized that I'd mentioned it on the last podcast. So uh, yeah, there's an air of serendipity there. Then so um, yeah, I suppose the book has been two or three years in the making. I mean, I guess I could argue it's been 30 odd years in the making in the sense that I've been doing sort of work in this area, you know, since the um, the mid to late 1980s. So it's, yeah. uh, you know, a long time. But uh, yeah, this sp- specific idea, I guess I was inspired a little bit by a lot of the other popular science books that have emerged over the last 10 years or so. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, thought it would be good if... Uh, I could pull together some of the research work that I've been doing and try and present it in a digestible manner for, uh, uh, you know, coaches, practitioners, parents, anybody interested in sport, basically. Yeah, and I think you know, I mean, we can list the the books, right? When when I look at yours, I think of Dan Coyle's The Talent Code or Matthew Said, Anders yeah. Ericsson, Peak. David Epstein sort of sports gene kind of retort or even his new book range touches on a lot of this stuff as well. Um, And, and this is what, what I really like about your book here is um, you you deal with some very difficult topics in a really balanced way. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I think some of those books come down so strongly on one side that it's easy to push back and say, yeah, well, you know, whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think what you, you did a lot is, you know, you kind of, well, I think you actually write in the book, you say one of the favorite lines is it depends. And a lot of your, your chapters are really, it depends. And then you cite so much science and research. It's just really great. I mean, you could spend days reading the footnotes of your book or going down those rabbit holes as well, which was mm. awesome because mm. I like doing that. So, mm. uh, I mean, you, uh, you raise a, a great point. Um, I guess, you know, all those books you mentioned I've read and, and they're great books. I suppose I did always feel a sense of frustration when listening to many of those books in the mm. sense that, that I thought that sometimes the science was spun in, in, a slightly more definitive way than is actually the case in reality. I mean, there's there's another line that I use, John, a lot, uh, particularly when talking to coaches. And um, you know, what I say is that is that coaches think in black and white, but then scientists think in shades of grey. Mm-hmm. And I suppose if if you're trying to write a popular science book, then it, it's sometimes attractive to take the you know polar ends of the argument and spin it out in one direction or another but um, I suppose one of the driving factors of this book was to be true to the science and Mm -hmm. um, I hope we've done that I mean the book has been reviewed by by a lot of my fellow scientists anyway as we've gone through the process of writing Mm -hmm. so I'm fairly confident about the accuracy of the science per se but Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you've obviously read the book, but a, a nice thing about the book, I think, is that there's there's a great balance between biographical interview information and interviews with elite athletes. And that's courtesy, of course, of my co-author, Tim Wigmore, who's a mm-hmm. journalist mm-hmm. working for the Daily Telegraph in the UK. So the book is not overly heavy. And I, there's a nice balance between um, entertainment 
and providing information around the science and yeah um, yeah no it's good I mean, us what the readers will think yeah you know it tells great stories that illustrate the different examples and it's not just from athletes right you have some top coaches in there as well which is great and and what i really like about the book and you know when i look at the different topics and, and the chapter titles everything from you know early specialization versus engagement and you know, relative age, where you're born, when you're born, what order you're born in, um, all these sort of things, you know, the, the effect of coaching, uh, the effect of, of, of vision and being able to see the game perception and action. There, there's so many great topics. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the difficulties of writing a book for all sports is that all sports are so different, right? And so yeah. I, I run into this with my work a lot when I talk about, you know, early specialization versus engagement and people want a one size fits all answer. And there's mm -hmm. not an answer yeah. when yeah. you're comparing sports as diverse as, you know, football, AKA soccer to, you know, the hundred meter dash or yeah. something like that, you know, where, where there's so many different variables. And that's why I think you do a, a great job in sort of blending this of like, here's what might work for this sport. And it might not be the same for this sport. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, the book touches upon a broad range of sports, but mm -hmm. I suppose the majority of the content focuses on the more popular sports mm -hmm. like soccer, basketball, American football, tennis, baseball, uh, all appear quite often. But um, yeah, the conclusions do depend a lot on the context. Um, uh, you know, the, the definitive statements that you're trying to, to bring out of it. But I think that the book does present a fairly holistic view of the factors that contribute to the development of elite athletes. So, so mm -hmm. for the readers, the book is essentially split into three sections. So the first part of the book looks at environmental issues and the role of serendipity or luck in the development of expertise. So it looks at issues like uh, the role of siblings, parents, uh, coaches, mentors, uh, where you're born. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the impact of seasonal birth date bias or the relative mm -hmm. age effect. Uh, and it looks at talent identification and also at the importance of street sport in the development mm -hmm. of elite athletes. Mm -hmm. And then I guess the middle section moves towards uh, outlining some of the adaptations that uh, arise in elite athletes through prolonged engagement in practice. So we mm -hmm. look at the development of game intelligence, for instance, mm -hmm. and and some of the psychological characteristics that underpin greatness and how elite athletes cope with the pressure of competition and mm -hmm. try and avo avoid choking and the many other adaptations that occur. I mean, the focus is mainly psychological, somewhat sociological, mm -hmm. but we do touch upon some of the physical and physiological adaptations as well. And I guess the last section turns this attention more towards coaching mm -hmm. um, you know, the role of coaches in facilitating and helping athletes make those key adaptations that are important on the path to performance excellence. Mm -hmm. Well, let's start, let, let's maybe work backwards, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. as, as I look sure. at sort of my, my questions, um, because that that part, the role of the coach, obviously, most of our listeners here are coaches. And mm -hmm. so this is where they're going to be where they can have the biggest impact from what they learn from from this book. And I one of the the place I'd like to start is sort of on this idea of learning or as I've heard you say, sort of the difference between performance, what we see in front of us in practice today, and learning, which is long term retention and the ability to deploy it in the game environment. And there's a great quote in the book. And I don't know if it's some, something you paraphrase from someone else or it's your direct words, but it says learning cannot be observed directly during practice, but has to be inferred from changes in performance over time. So let's unpack that to start. Yeah, I mean, in a, in a simple sense, if, you, uh, if you've got a coaching session and you've got 16, 12 year old girls that you're working with, for instance, whatever the sport, we can talk about soccer if you like, then what you see in that particular session is their performance, mm -hmm. not their learning, because you cannot actually directly observe le learning. It is, of course, a biological change in the system. Mm -hmm. So all you can do is actually 
look to infer that learning has taken place over time. Mm -hmm. So two things are, are crucial here. You therefore need to see that the change in performance that you see in that coaching session actually is retained over subsequent coaching sessions. Mm -hmm. And you also need to see that the skills that they're showing in that session actually transfer to novel variations of that practice session and of course the ultimate test that it actually transfers to actual competition mm -hmm. and the reason why this differentiation between performance and learning is important is that they interact with different instructional variables mm -hmm. so by way of example if i want the best performance in a particular coaching session then i know that, that would be greatly facilitated if I provide lots of verbal instruction, mm -hmm. uh, use demonstrations copiously, do specific blocked practice of a single skill, mm -hmm. and provide lots of feedback. Mm -hmm. And generally, they produce the best performance. And then I can feel good about myself when I leave yeah. the field that day. Look how well, much I just taught them. <laughs> if, if, yeah, yeah. if I'm not I mean, thinking about this, like, yeah, I mean, there, there is some element of that, but I suppose yeah. you could say that for the athletes as well. You know, they probably well, yeah. leave that session thinking, well, that went quite well. But, <laughs> yeah. but, but the difficulty is, or the paradox, so to speak, is that almost the reverse conditions mm -hmm. seem to present better conditions for learning. So that maybe the challenge would be, well, what is the least amount of instruction that I need to give these athletes so that it can begin yeah. to practice the skills? To what extent is the practice variable and dynamic such that it reflects the demands of competition and specificity is, remains still mm -hmm. one of the strongest rules of, rules of science. And I think that, that the concept of specificity not only applies, of course, to the technical and tactical demands of practice, but it also relates to physical demands, uh, stress, anxiety, emotions. Uh, so then your practice conditions need to mimic that and of course, what is the least amount of feedback that I need to give these athletes so that yeah. they can uh, focus on being more independent in the learning process? And those latter type of conditions do tend to promote better long-term retention and transfer. That is, they best promote long-term skill development and learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think this is, and so the obstacles that we then run into as a coach is number one, um, we're, we're witnessing struggle and we have to know that, you know, number one, that our, our practice design and the things that we're doing will promote the things that we want to see down the line. Yeah. And at the same time, so it's okay that they struggle today. Number two, yeah. we can face athlete frustration because they don't feel like they're getting better. Right. And so I know there's been surveys of, of learners thinking, oh, I, I'm, I'm not learning well here in these moments when actually you are. Right. And there's been uh, I think the research was out of the U.S. Air Force Academy where they looked at teacher ratings mm -hmm. and and the teachers who got the best ratings by their students often had the worst long term results in math mm -hmm. and, and engineering yeah. classes, you know, it, because they forced them to struggle more and kids didn't do as well on the exam, but the long-term learning was better. Um, yeah. And then number three, those of us who work at grassroots parents, right? I mean, a lot of parents like cones and lines and perfect organization. They don't like to see chaos. No, no. I, I think you raise great points. I mean, um, there's a cultural expectation amongst the parents that, that coaches are, are very hands-on in the process. And, um, Especially in the U S I think. Uh, probably, but, but I would say to some extent that exists globally as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a challenge. Uh, but all the time, I guess this, uh, you know, this is the intuitive nature of coaching, isn't it? In that there's a big balance that needs to be had here to walk towards, to what extent are you focusing on short-term performance mm -hmm. and to what extent are you focusing on long-term learning and development? And of mm -hmm. course, long-term learning and development is the ultimate goal, but at the same time, you don't want the kids to be leaving the session either you know thinking as you said that i'm not very good at this and i might not come back next week yeah so that's that's a very difficult challenge for the coach uh, and it's not helped of course by the notion that what you know what you see in practice is not necessarily what you get as far as learning is concerned mm -hmm. uh, uh, and rightly you could have a session that looks great kids leave happy parents leave happy 
coach's self-esteem is enhanced, but there's been no learning that's taken place. Yeah. Whereas in contrast, you can have sessions where there's an element of chaos in there. It seems to be all over the place. Uh, you know, kids and parents are wondering what's going on and the coach is a bit frustrated, but those conditions can sometimes be much more effective than yeah. promoting the learning. And I and I think I, I think I actually quoted you in my last book in one of the beginning one of the chapters that says uh, coaching may be an art, but it doesn't mean it can't be informed by science. Yeah. And yeah. and and this is you know and so the art of coaching is finding that balance of what's too much struggle and what's not enough, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's understanding where your intervention is needed, maybe the kind word, the quiet word to the kid who thinks that I might not come back next week because I'm not doing well to, to realize, no, you actually are, you're getting better. Um, yeah. And yeah. I think also the patience to, to see the process play out, right? Mm -hmm. That slow learning is sticky learning. And so I gotta, I've got to stick with this. And like I work with a bunch of coaches here in Oregon within my club and I've helped them this year instill a sort of a, a, a methodology of how we're going to coach and how we're going to play um, with my friend Todd Bean from Spain. And, um, you know, we it's really interesting because you're not going to see the results in a week. Right. Or mm -hmm. a month. But it's been fun now, five months into it, talking to some of the coaches to say, hey, blend your B team kids with the A team once in a while. It'll help them catch up. Um, keep doing rondos, keep doing position play games rather than blocking your practice and working on passing or wh whatever, right? Because that's that's where the transfer will happen and now all of a sudden five months later some of them are starting to come back and saying i was super skeptical but now all of a sudden i'm seeing it right because mm -hmm. they didn't just learn how to technically pass a ball they learned the skill of passing to a moving teammate between moving defenders at the right pace mm -hmm. <laughs> to the correct mm -hmm. foot and then where to mm -hmm. move afterwards which is really mm -hmm. what the skill of passing is mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think if you cultivate uh, that more hands-off approach to instruction and uh, engage the learners a lot more in the skill development process, then you will definitely see those adaptations that occur in players over time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then you, you know, you'll be part of that journey, so to speak, so that what you find is that once they get used to that approach to coaching, that... Um, it becomes part of their cultural expectation moving forward. But but I guess the difficulty you're correctly highlighting is the fact that you do have to get over that initial phase. Yeah, you can't get uh, fired in the first month. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it, 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 it's possible, isn't it? I mean, so I, and, and to some degree, the question is, how would you get parents and kids engaged in that process? Mm -hmm. um, let them know that, you know, there is a clear journey and a path that you're trying to follow here. Mm -hmm. um, I think is is very very important, but 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 I think you know you, you rightly point out. I mean, I still do a lot of coach education work, and mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, one of the things I start off the session saying is is in essence that I'm I'm not here to teach them how to coach, so to speak. What I do is I try and enhance their professional knowledge about concepts of learning and how people learn more eff efficiently and effectively. Mm -hmm. But then it's a totally different task then in terms of deciding how you're going to take that science and the principles of effective skill acquisition and then apply those concepts mm -hmm. uh, in, in the, the practice of designing and delivering coaching sessions. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to some degree, one of the other sayings that I use quite often to use a golf analogy is I think coach education programs are very good at teaching people how to use every club in the bag but aren't necessarily very good at teaching people how to play around the golf. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe to some degree, there is a need for more of an ongoing continuing professional development process where coaches have the opportunity to engage with experienced mentors, you know, people with a background like myself in skill acquisition, so that uh, it becomes a dialogue about how do we put some of these concepts about effective skill learning into practice mm -hmm. uh, whatever the sport is whether it's baseball soccer or, or basketball i think there's a lot that 
coaches could garner from that sort of type of embedded support structure over time. Yeah. And I, and I do a lot of this with local coaches of, of just, you know, after the practice, you know, doing a debrief of it and, you know, what went well and, and what needs work and what could you have done better for this activity or whatever. But it, it was funny, you know, I was working with one recently mm. and just at the end, um, this coach was not, you know, they weren't playing a game at the end or, a, you know, a scrimmage with, you know, two goals and, and whatever. And, and I, so I just pulled the kids aside and I said, what was this practice scale of one to 10, one being I'm never coming back and 10 being the greatest one ever. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, so at first they're all yelling 10 and I'm like, really, this is the best practice. You've ever? And then, then they come oh Okay. Seven. I'm like, okay, great. Seven. What would make it an eight? What would make it a nine? Mm-hmm. And they were like, we just want to play at the end. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. We just want to play it in. And I just turned to the coach. I'm like, there you go. Right. Like they'll yeah. tell you, you give them some opportunity. They'll tell you how you can make this better. They know it's in them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I, I, and that's, that's the kind of comment from kids that I've heard many times before, you know, they want to play in the end, but I suppose you could spin that around and say, why can't they play at the start? Oh yeah, that too. <laughs> I, yeah, I, exactly. I, 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 and I guess, you know, we've done work where we've done um, video analysis of yeah. 80 coaching sessions yeah. involving uh, a third of the coaches were Premier League coaches working with youth players. Yeah. A third were centres of excellent players and the third were sort of local uh, charter standard clubs. And, um, you know, what we found is, is that typically coaches uh, were having players engage in what we term training form activity 65% of the time. So training form activity are things like physical conditioning, Mm-hmm. Uh, typically without the ball, uh, technical work with the ball, but with no opponent, mm-hmm. and then structured drill and grid-based practices. Mm-hmm. And that only 35% of the time were the kids actually engaging in practice activities that mimic the demands of match play. So small-sided games, conditioned games, phase mm-hmm. play. Mm-hmm. And that actually that ratio didn't change mm-hmm. as a function of the skill level of the players or the age of the players. We had actually had uh, coaches working with kids that are under nine, under thirteen, and under sixteen. Mm-hmm. So it does it does seem as if the coaches typically have a preferred structure mm-hmm. designed to to a, a, a sort of a coaching session. But you know, there's a lot of evidence now, particularly around highlighting the importance of street sport in the development of uh, game intelligence skills, for instance. That um, maybe we should always start with the game. Yeah. Try and coach as much as possible through that medium. Yeah, uh, and that that I think would be better for the technical development, tactical development of the kids, and of course for their enjoyment of the sport. Yeah, and and certainly I, I give U.S. soccer credit now that's gone into play practice play, yeah. you know, especially for for twelve and unders, and I think um, you know I think Germany now is using Faninho Horst Wien's work on which is really play practice play as well, right? you know, in, in a certain format, sometimes attack two and defend two goals. But I, I think this is so important because we can teach within the game and then we can pull something out. But it also, you know, I always say to people, you know, when the coach says, oh, well, this kid can't receive a ball or he can't pass a ball. Um, you know, my, my comment is always, and, you know, a 4v1 Rondo doesn't teach him that he can't pass or can't receive. Plus it also teaches him to look for a defender, to look for an opponent, to reach, receive the ball on the correct foot, to position his body the correct way. None of which happens when Mark and I are passing a ball back and forth, talking about playing Fortnite last night. Right. So um, yeah, no, this is great. Um, How does coach feedback fit into this? You mentioned it a little bit before, but um you know, feedback is an important yeah. part of this, right? When we intervene, what we say. Yeah, I mean, feedback is, um, well, the literature says it's the second most important variable in skill learning after practice itself. But, you know, at the same time, the literature also says, of course, that um, uh, feedback becomes less important as skill develops and that ultimately skilled athletes are able to process their own sources of feedback. So I guess in many ways, the sooner we can encourage that transition so that the learner becomes more independent, mm-hmm. the, uh, the better. So using approaches like a question and answer approach mm-hmm. uh, where you, you might ask the player, you know, what, 
what do you think went right or wrong there? And what do you think mm. you might do differently next time? Or giving feedback after a, a block of trials, what they call summary feedback, rather than feedback every attempt is important. So the coach, in essence, does need to find ways to try and fade out feedback as quickly as possible. Because the problem ultimately, of course, is that the athletes have to perform without feedback. Mm -hmm. So the sooner we can wean them off uh, augmented feedback from a coach um, and get them to rely more on their own ability to process information, then then the better that would be, really. Yeah, no, for sure, right? That they, especially in the more dynamic invasion games, <clears throat> they've got to solve the problem on the fly. There's no time for feedback to solve that problem, right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and if they've gotten only feedback their whole life growing up to solve the problem, you know, at what point do you let them go versus figure it out, figure it out? Like you said, like street soccer, yeah. the game, you have to figure out how am I going to solve this problem yeah. or pond hockey or, or, you don't, or, you, or you don't get invited back next you year. You don't get invited back <laughs> unless you own a really nice ball, right? Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I love that. Um, so, so building on that, then I know one of the things that your a lot of your research on is you know in the idea of like perception and action and situational awareness, right? Scanning yeah. the role of vision. Yeah. Um, talk about that for a second, and, and how important that is, and and how that separates the best from the rest of us. Um, well, certainly in team sports and fastball sports, then the ability to be able to anticipate or read the game becomes very important, I guess. I mean, you know, in those sports, there are quite severe time constraints. So you mm -hmm. don't have time to react to what's happening. You have to be able to read in advance of the, the event itself what will happen. Um, there's now a fairly substantive literature base that shows that um, elite athletes develop these so-called perceptual cognitive skills uh, through prolonged engagement in the sport. So skills like, for instance, the ability to um, pick up uh, postural cues from the body shape of an opponent that, to help them predict where the pass is going to go, uh, the ability to pick up structure, structure and patterns of play from the evolving action sequence, you know, the interactions between, say, midfield players and strikers. And of course, if they can identify some kind of familiarity in that evolving sequence of play, then they can then predict what will happen before it actually happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also know that experts use the visual system much mm -hmm. more effectively. There's been a lot of work recently, of course, that has looked at um, head scanning mm -hmm. and, and this notion that the top players uh rotate the head around and, and take visual snapshots of the field mm -hmm. and that uh you know often they de they do this sort of 50 60 times a minute per minute yeah. a minute so so it's uh and i guess it helps give them an awareness of the positions and movements of players around them but i mean of course it's, scanning is one aspect of the process you also need to be able to extract the right information from that scan yeah, that's what i was going to ask you about because looking means nothing that, right that's, if if, the, yeah. if that does if it doesn't mean anything to you yeah so so yeah so there's there's two aspects <laughs> to this process isn't there i mean merely tra training the player to turn their head and take these visual snapshots more often than than they currently are in and of itself is not necessarily going to improve performance because yeah. it's, just, it's about understanding the structure and the patterns that, that is within the visual scene that is that is very, very important. Uh, but, but certainly experts use the gaze system more effectively. You know, they fixate on different areas of the display. Mm -hmm. uh, we typically measure this, of course, using eye tracking systems mm -hmm. where, um, you know, you can see where people are looking. Uh, and uh, not only do experts fixate on different areas of the display for varying periods of time but they also use peripheral vision of course a lot more so peripheral vision is very sensitive to motion yeah so what you might see for instance in the case of a center back in soccer is that he or she may fixate on the ball or the lower body in possession of the ball let's say when he or she's on the edge of the penalty area but in essence there will also be monitoring going on mm -hmm. uh, of, of movements in the mm -hmm. periphery and the two sources of information together, the motion in the periphery and the relevant postural cues that they're picking up from 
the player in possession of the ball will help them make those judgments. And mm -hmm. then one, one of the other key perceptual cognitive skills that I've not mentioned as well, of course, is this ability of experts to, um, uh, they've virtually developed a hierarchy of probabilities in the sense that given the context and the situation where the ball is, where the players are, what is the most likely pass in this particular situation? Mm -hmm. So, you know, perhaps rather surprisingly, therefore, I mean, you will often see commentators go, the athlete's got a great eye or supervision. Mm -hmm. Well, that technically isn't true, actually, in the sense that when you test the visual function of elite athletes, then typically they don't perform any better than sub-elite athletes. So they're not like Superman. It's not a vision thing. It's a perception thing. Mm -hmm. um, the notion is, is that through this prolonged engagement in the sport, experts develop knowledge structures that allow them to see the world in a different way mm -hmm. from those less expert in the sport. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and these so-called perceptual cognitive skills allow them to process information earlier, thus making it look as if they've got all the time in the world. Yeah. Yeah. No. And uh, you then when you have the opportunity to watch a player like that play, and when you mm -hmm. say that my my mind switches to watching Zinedine Zidane play for Real Madrid and they're yeah. playing Roma. And my comment to my friend at the game was, it looks like he's playing in a park game, you know, mm -hmm. it's just moving so slowly and perfectly for him. Every pass yeah. is weighted. Every movement is timed. He, he sees everything. And, and it was, it was so amazing to watch and he's playing against elite international players mm -hmm. and it just looks easy. Like, yeah. how does he always have space? <laughs> how does he yeah. always get the ball at the right time? And that's like you said, it's not that, that he can see the space. He, he, he can perceive when to show up there, how to get there, and then have the technical ability to deliver the pass or the cross or the shot. Hmm. Yeah, with precision absolutely. As well. uh, I mean, we, we do know based on some research that we've done that um, these game intelligence skills do differentiate players as early as seven or eight years of age. Uh, and then it, it sort of comes up with the interesting question, well, does that suggest that there are some genetic differences here? Mm -hmm. uh, although when we've looked at the developmental history profiles of elite and sub-elite players, even at age eight, there's a big difference in the hours that have accumulated in practice. Mm -hmm. you know, a skilled eight-year-old, certainly in the UK, will have accumulated over a thousand hours mm -hmm. in practice. Mm -hmm. Whereas less skilled players might only have accumulated three to 400. Mm -hmm. So we don't know whether those differences that exist early on are a product of that increased exposure to the sport at an early age, mm -hmm. or whether there are some potential genetic factors that impact on the development of these types of skills. Right. Uh, I mean, they've done some research in twins, right? Like say, okay, who's more likely than twins to be genetically alike and exposed to the same thing over time um, mm -hmm. to see. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, there hasn't been any research that has looked to my knowledge uh, that has looked longitudinally at the development of game intelligence skills. Mm -hmm. and of course, there are interesting questions like if someone scores very high on these kinds of measures at eight years of age, does that mean that he or she will also do well on those measures at 14, 15? Mm -hmm. None of that research exists. I mean, what, what we do know is that um, those who have superior game intelligence in older age groups have typically accumulated a lot more hours in street football during yeah. development. Yeah. So, we're specifically relating to, to, to soccer here, although there's some evidence from other sports as well. Uh, and maybe, again, that's because of the concept that we referred before, that, you know, in a street soccer environment, um, typically it's a very chaotic dynamic situation the kids replicate situations that they see during a match mm -hmm. and they continually engage in decision making Yeah, and uh, you know the element of specificity comes in again I mean clearly if you're continually making decisions then at some point one hopes that you will become better at making decisions Yeah, so, yeah. so it probably isn't surprising in that regard that um the way that we design practice sessions, whether if we even go outside of street sport and talk about coach-led practice, I mean, mm -hmm. you have a similar argument in the sense that if the coach designs practice sessions that 
necessitate that players are continually making decisions in an independent manner, mm -hmm. then there's a better chance that players will develop the skills of effective decision making. Mm -hmm. Whereas obviously in a lot of grid and drill based practices, often the decision is already made for the player. Yeah. In so much as the, the coach will say, well, I want you to receive the ball, turn and play it to that player over there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's essentially purely a technical practice rather than integrating technical skills with the, the decision making component of it. So I think there's a lot we could do from an instructional systems design perspective to mm -hmm. better develop training practices that help facilitate the development of those types of skills. Um, I mean, there are other potential interventions in, mm -hmm. in the sense that um, the use of simulation training, particularly virtual reality, mm -hmm. uh, certainly at the higher end of the game, is becoming increasingly popular mm -hmm. uh, because of the opportunity, I guess, to recreate and replicate situations that you see during matches in order to increase exposure of players to those types of situations. And uh, at a more applied level, there's been some interesting stuff using video-based feedback mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, coaches and players might sit down after a game and go through aspects of decision-making that occur during the game and mm -hmm. talk to the player in an effort to facilitate self-reflection, mm -hmm. uh, which may enhance the, um, the development of the knowledge structures that underpin decision-making. Yeah, it's an amazing area. And, and again, I think the, one of the difficulties with the, any sort of longitudinal study is we, we start at the end and say, oh, Javi, and we work backwards instead of starting with the 50 kids who were eight years old with Javi and say, why did he become Javi? Yeah. And 48 of them didn't make it. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and that's the, that's the really, cause that's when you get, is there genetic, is there luck? Cause he didn't get hurt. Is there, mm. you know, you know, how different would the careers of the Xavi or the Iniesta or the Messi be if Pep Guardiola didn't become the coach at Barcelona versus someone else who said, mm. you know, we're going to park the boss and counter attack, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, it's probably also worth noting as well, John, I guess, that there are different types of decision making. Mm -hmm. As Nobel laureate Dan Daniel Kahneman outlined in his book, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, mm -hmm. you know, there there's a slow and structured approach to decision making, which may be um, heavily consciously driven. Mm -hmm. And then there's a kind of a fast and intu intuitive aspect to decision making. And I guess that both those levels of decision making uh, are probably engaged when we play in sports. Mm -hmm. I guess interesting questions become how does how does the training need to differ to develop <clears throat> each of those different types of skills? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's hard. I mean, again, th this is what I love about coaching. This is what I love about your book. This is what I love about conversations like this, because I think as coaches now we can take in this information and we can go out and we can try things and hey, is is this is this truly helping? I think any of us who have coached, and I know you have, you know, you know, grassroots sport, and you look at a kid who maybe has technique, but consistently makes the wrong decision on the ball or on the puck. And you go, okay, what's, what's the problem here? Cause it's not more technical reps that this kid needs. He yeah. or she is just not seeing the ice or the field or the court like someone else is who's making, who, you know, like you said before, I have a, I have four possible passes and one of them is better than the next one is better than the next one is better than the next. Mm. Um, if I consistently choose option three or four, I'm not going to make it very far If I'm really good at picking the best option. I'm going to make it through the system. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the scientific literature, they differentiate between routine expertise and adaptive expertise. So routine mm. experts, are able to solve most problems most of the time, whereas adaptive experts, as the title suggests, are very flexible and creative, and they're able to find a solution almost in an intuitive manner to whatever problem that, that they're presented with. And I guess you have to think about the nature and the environment and the type of coaching that develops those two different types of expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe the biggest challenge for coaches as much as anything, actually, is that uh, you know, it's a stressful process, isn't it, coaching? And, mm -hmm. and ultimately, you know, coaches, uh, you know, we've been in that situation. You spend a lot of time preparing your session. 
and you want to look slick and professional and you want everything to go off in a very structured, organized manner. But, uh, you know, maybe coaches need to look at it in the sense that one training session is not going to change that player in a significant way. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should be a little bit more relaxed. It doesn't mean that we don't need a clear um, strategy or plan in terms of what we're hoping to get out of that session. But if it gets a bit messy and it doesn't quite turn out how you'd expect it, I don't think coaches invariably should get stressed about it because it may well be that there are some secret ingredients there in the process of learning that's important. Having that chaos is um, part of the process that players and coaches have to learn to deal with. You know, it's not a structured world. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. And I was talking to a friend of mine who's a professional, you know, a top level coach the other day, and he was just talking about how, in their training structure, you know, a lot of their Rondo and, so, you know, in soccer and Rondo and position play games, he's just started adding, you know, you know, goals on the outside. So we see these Rondos, right. Where it's six feet two and you poke the ball away in the middle and we all laugh mm-hmm. and you come out, the next guy goes in. He's like, but that's not the game. Right. You know, yeah. he's like, so playing a lot more like six V four. And if the four get it, they're trying to, pass out to a goal and the Mm. six need to collapse on them and try to win it back and then expand back and how much more realistic that is Mm. to game transfer that when we give the ball away we don't jog to the middle and become the defender right (laughs) you know and and and, yeah And, and a lot of the concepts we've spoken about so far has been about specificity and designing these practice sessions so that they're realistic of, of performance. But I think another point that I'd like to raise actually, which is uh, discussed in the book under the chapter of deliberate practice, of course, mm-hmm. is the challenge for the coach of creating individualized approaches to learning. Mm-hmm. So the concept of deliberate practice is that it's specific, purposeful, and designed to improve a specific aspect of performance. Mm-hmm. And that might be distinct, for instance, from maintenance practice, where Mm -hmm. maintenance is one where you're just maintaining a current level of functioning. So given this challenge that as a coach, you know, you might have 16 boys or girls in the session, 12, 14 years of age, whatever, and they're all at different levels of ability, Mm -hmm. then clearly how do we create training environments that are challenging for all of those players? Uh, I mean, in the learning literature, they talk a lot about the challenge point. So the Mm -hmm. challenge point is a particular level of difficulty where the system is being pushed to Mm -hmm. adapt to the constraints placed upon it. And, um, you know, when you've got six, potentially 16 odd players of varying level of ability, then that's a really difficult challenge. You know, how many of those players are actually engaging in deliberate practice per se, and how many of them are just uh, practicing things they're already good at? Uh, and yeah. we know actually, you know, we've looked at how experts and how less expert athletes train. And what you find is that experts spend more time practicing the things they're not good at. Yeah. Whereas less experts spend a lot of time practicing the things that, that they're actually good at. Yeah. And if, if I use another analogy, you've got to, to put that into context in the sense that, you know, learning is a biological change in the system, as I said before. So, uh, if we go to the gym and you know we want to build a biceps muscle, then you need a certain level of weight in the arm curl before you get adaptations to the muscle. Mm-hmm. So you know, for you it might be 30, 50 pounds on that on that dumbbell before you start to get some adaptations to the neural structure of the, the muscle. For others, of course, it might just be 10 pounds. Mm-hmm. So it's the same concept in learning. You know, when you design those practice sessions, how do you make sure that each athlete gets the right stimulus from a learning perspective in order to lead to the necessary biological changes that underpin learning? Yeah. And I think this two things that that brings to mind. Number one, why games based learning is best because the game will always challenge you. Right. And and you're you're as an advanced learner within the game might try a more difficult pass than the less advanced learner versus some sort of block practice where you don't need reps on that. And I do. Um, 
and and number two, I think, and this is one of the biggest things when it comes to grassroots coaching, the the people who are coaching our youngest children. For me, that's always the most challenging environment where you have the greatest variance of ability, right? Mm-hmm. Like even if you're at La Masia, you know, you have a best kid and and you know your weakest kid, they're all pretty good. Um, mm-hmm. But when you're coaching, you know, U8, you know, in Park City, you might have three really engaged, a lot of hours, four or five decent athletes in the middle, and three who are only there because their parents want yeah. them out of the house. Yeah. And that is the most yeah. challenging environment. How do I challenge all those kids? I mean, what's 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 your advice? Because <laughs> people ask me that all the time. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think it's probably more of an issue in the US than it might be in more developed countries, uh, if you not putting that in a negative way from the US perspective, because obviously soccer has developed hugely in the US over the last few decades. But in the UK, for instance, there is more of a pyramid type structure, mm-hmm. whereas kids who show promise and who develop well have the then opportunity to move to the next level. Right. Uh, and ultimately, what you want, of course, is a situation or a structure that allows the best players to be playing together with Mm -hmm. the best coaches under the right facilities, Mm -hmm. systems and structures as early as possible. And where you've got such a variance in ability levels between kids, then it's very, very difficult to do that. And of course the US is also so large Mm -hmm. and and typically those pyramid structures I don't think are as well developed. So, so that's an issue to reflect on quite a lot. I mean, also, uh, you know, and it, it probably reflects our conversation earlier in, in, in this show in, in the sense that um, whilst the principles that we're talking about, the use of small-sided games, the use of less hands-off approaches to instruction uh, and so on and so forth, are obviously, we, we think, the best conditions that promote the development of skill in elite players. Mm-hmm. Okay, but not every child who plays soccer uh, will be an elite player or even wants to be an elite player. Mm-hmm. So, th- so then you have the difficult scenario from, from the coach's perspective. Then, well, maybe blocked repetitive drill, drill based practice is fine yeah. for those kids because ultimately, you know, they only want to enjoy the sport, learn some skills that they can then use through, through the lifetime. Mm-hmm. So you can see that maybe the optimal conditions that encourage mass participation in the sport mm-hmm. uh, for physical activity and health perspectives may not be the same conditions that promote the development of elite players within that particular sport. Mm-hmm. So then the challenge becomes how do we mesh those systems yeah. where we've got, we get participation for those whose interests lie in that area and yeah. who maybe don't have the abilities to progress beyond that level, but at the same time have a structure that stimulates and challenges the better players the more motivated players to have those opportunities to grow and develop to the next level yeah i mean we're hitting all the the giant challenges here as a coach and and like you said as big as that challenge is that's often handed to the least experienced coach or the least trained Mm -hmm. coach here in the united states whereas other countries have done a better job with that let me let me bring up another area that gets a lot of talk and that you deal with in the book, this idea of early specialization versus early engagement in sport. Cause this yeah. is again, a really tough one to cast a one size fits all net. Yeah. Um, yeah. But just talk about that for a second and we'll dive into that. Well, this is the chapter where it concludes with the, it depends. <laughs> it depends. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned earlier. And um, I mean, uh, it depends on the sport literally. It depends on the cultural popularity of the sport. Uh, it depends on whether earlier engagement is the norm. It mm-hmm. depends on the technical and tactical demands of the sport relative to the physical and physiological demands. So there are there are some sports where um, uh, late specialization is the norm. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, we, we use an example from ro- uh, rowing. Helen Glover, who's a GB Olympic medal winner, uh, she specialized late into the sport. So there yeah. are lots of sports where late specialization is the norm. There are lots of sports where early specialization is mm-hmm. almost a prerequisite. If you think about right. gymnastics. Gymnastics, yeah. 
And uh, there are other sports which embrace what we've referred to as the early engagement model. Yeah. So the early engagement model is one where you might spend a lot of hours engaging in one or at most two sports, but at the same time, you continue to sample other sports during the, the, the development. Mm -hmm. uh, examples of such sports would be certainly soccer fits mm -hmm. that men's, the men's and women's game mm -hmm. and uh, downhill skiing in mm -hmm. the U S fits that model as well. You know, typically soccer players engage around four to five years of age, ski skiers even earlier. Yeah. Very young. Uh, but, but they don't, Obviously, skiing is seasonal as well, which helps, I guess, in terms of diversity. But um, uh, but typically, soccer players, elite soccer players, men's and women's, will have accumulated around five thousand hours or so by the age of sixteen. Mm -hmm. uh, they will have probably sampled two or three other sports, but to a much much lesser extent. Uh, and is that a combination of? Um... Is that a combination of organized and informal, depending on the country? Like a Brazilian kid might accumulate more futsal street soccer hours than a kid growing yeah. up in the UK might. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And we've got data to, to support that. I mean, there's very little structured coaching in Brazil before the age of 12, actually. And in fact, the professional clubs can't access the kids till they're 12. Mm -hmm. Whereas obviously in the UK, some of the academies, I believe Manchester City five. an under fives team yeah. uh, recently. So, um, you know, they're engaging earlier. And that's fine, of course. And it's actually not so much about whether it's um, coach-led or non-coach-led. It's actually about the nature of the coaching. So there's no reason, of course, why coaches can't be overseeing a coaching session yeah. and creating a training or a practice environment that mimics street football. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's, it's actually not about whether it's coach-led or non-coach-led. It's about the nature of the activity and the extent to which it's, it's specific reflects the demands of competition and is sat at the right level that challenges the individual to to make the adaptations that are that are actually necessary. Yeah. And so what we're seeing now is a lot more even in the formalized training programs introducing whether it's games based or more free play. You know, it, it's like free play within an organized structure. Here's a safe place yeah. to play more because obviously that is going to have the demands of the game because it is the game yeah. Um, yeah. and the coaches are backing out more and letting kids figure this out. I don't know if you ever saw, I, I should send you this article if you haven't, um, but there's a, there's a guy in uh, Minneapolis, Ted Creighton, who's a, a big guy in the U S on free play. And he set up this whole free play center and he connected with, you know, one of the clubs out of Europe, uh, Dinamo Zagreb, that was very famous for some of mm -hmm. the players they were producing, Kovacic at Chelsea and uh, a couple others. I think Luka Modric started there too. And anyway, he, he what he was talking about was, um, you know, they were getting, you know, he saw them present and they were talking about all these kids, six and seven, everything we do with the right foot, we do with the left foot and all this structure, structure, structure. And look at all the players that we're selling on to these big clubs. And so he did some research and he looked at the mo like the 12 most expensive players that they sold. Mm -hmm. Only one of them was with the club before his 16th birthday. <laughs> So he said, wait a sec, if you, this is so perfect, then shouldn't all your seven-year-olds be surpassing these kids that you're signing at 16 or 14 or whatever it is? Like you only had one kid who came to you when he was nine. You yeah. know? Well, and that is the same with most of these Premier League academies, actually. There's only about 1% of the players who start the academy, less than 1% who start the academy at age six who actually end up in the first team at age 18, 19, 20. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, but but then at least I, I would hope the quality of the coaching is good and they have the opportunity to, to develop. But coming back to your original question around early versus late specialization again, I mean, I suppose the what's been cited as the disadvantages of early specialization is, is the potential risk of burnout, overuse injuries, mm -hmm. and early, early dropout from the sport. Uh, but then on the other side of the argument, the flip side of the coin is, is the notion that, well, the challenges of not engaging early enough is that you may end up with a practice deficit. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we've looked at some of our data, for instance, that I might have possibly compared Australia and the US to the UK, mm 
mm-hmm. then typically in Australia and the US, it's uh, the cultures are around uh, diversification and engagement in multiple sports. Mm-hmm. And when you look at the typical nine-year-old in Australia and uh, the US, they probably accumulated around 1,500 hours in soccer-specific practice mm-hmm. over that period of time. Mm-hmm. Whereas in contrast, if you look at these kids in the UK, then uh, you know there's less diversity. There mm-hmm. is some diversity, but less so. Mm -hmm. And the kids have accumulated around 3,000 hours by age nine, uh, nine, ten. So um, what you have there is a practice deficit, even at age nine, between a U.S. talented player in the U.S. and a talented player in the U.K. In a sport, of course, that's heavily dependent on game intelligence skill and Mm -hmm. ball mastery. Mm -hmm. So the question is that if you're not engaging early enough, can you then make up that practice deficit? Mm -hmm. Uh, and of course, the, the practice deficit is also partly dependent on the quality of the coaching and, right. the, and the practice opportunities. So clearly not every hour of practice carries the same volume or value. But but at the same time, that is a challenge. Yeah. If you engage early enough, you might have a practice deficit. So personally, I, I quite like the early engagement model in the sense that I think it encourages the best of both worlds in sports which are very popular culturally where early engagement is the norm Mm -hmm. uh, which are heavily focused on technical and tactical skills and i think you have to engage early probably Mm -hmm. to develop those skills but at the same time it would be like we'll we'll call that child driven versus coach driven right more intrinsic motivation i want to play yeah Um, Yeah. and i do a lot of this i do a lot of this but yeah i dabble in these things yeah, no, no. And maybe we need to give more honors to the child here. At the end of the day, yeah. if, the ch- if the child is really passionate about the sport and interested in it, then let them play. Let them play as much as they mm-hmm. want. Mm-hmm. At the same time, you know, if I mean, when I, when I was growing up, I only wanted to play soccer. You know, I didn't mm-hmm. want to play anything else. Mm-hmm. And actually, when I was pushed into doing other things, it didn't make me particularly happy. I yeah. just wanted to play to play soccer. So why would you compel kids to take other sports if, if that's not where their interest lies? Right. And I think uh, the challenge is, so then we have, we want them to engage. We don't want this practice deficit. Yet at the same yeah. time as the adults in the room, the coach, the parents, I have to monitor them for burnout and injury. Right. So yeah. because yeah. obviously you're not going to stay on the practice hours path if you keep getting injured all the time, too. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And I would certainly not discourage kids, even if they're if they're engaging early to a mm-hmm. reasonable degree in one or two other sports to participate in a broad variety of different sports. You know, at, at the end of the day, it certainly won't do them any harm. Mm -hmm. I mean, what what we don't know either, to be honest, and the empirical evidence is weak on this regard, is that um, what actually transfers. Mm -hmm. So intuitively, anecdotally, people talk about the fact that skills transfer. But when you look at across sports, across sports. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, But when you look at the research evidence, it's less compelling than you would think. Mm-hmm. And I'm not implying that transfer doesn't incur. I'm just mm-hmm. implying that the research evidence is is not that strong. I mean, there mm-hmm. is some evidence that some aspects of transfer occur, but you know, far less than you would think. And then there are there are other questions that we really have no idea on, in the sense of um, even when you talk about early specialization, late specialization. Then, well, let's talk about early engagement, for instance. If I so if I'm playing six eight hours of soccer per week and then I also play tennis once a week for an hour and I ski for a couple of weeks during winter is that specialization or is that diversification Mm -hmm. and on the other end of the spectrum I might still be playing soccer six hours a week but then I might also be playing two hours of basketball two hours of baseball Mm -hmm. we really have no idea we can't actually accurately define what specialization, uh, right. what what um, diversification is. So right, like we know we know the bumps. we know the bumpers, right? We know twenty seven hours a week of gymnastics for a, an eight year old is yeah. specialization, but we don't. Yeah. It's where where it gets gray yeah. in the middle. Yeah, yeah. So so, what type of other activities would be helpful? What transfers? When? Yes. At what age? 
uh, are, are kind of questions that we don't really have great answers to as far as the science is concerned. Yeah, I mean, we certainly have, I think of the late Kobe Bryant talking about growing up playing soccer in Italy, uh, he mm -hmm. felt made him a better basketball player. And Steve yeah. Nash, again, in basketball, who didn't start basketball until he was 13, yeah, was yeah. a soccer yeah. player and his brother was a professional player, you know, and so, and, and credits it as well. But like you said, that's anecdotal. There's no, there's not robust no, research no that says on that. You know, I mean, even, even, even in the book, we present some examples, you know, Slatan Ibrahimovic. Yeah, exactly. Cre credits his ability to do overhead kids with kicks with the fact that he did jujitsu. Um, he scored uh, another one the other day that was pretty impressive, you know, oh, at, at 38, yeah, 39 years old. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's, he's incredible. Um, Djokovic, the tennis player, argues that, you know, his ability to slide around the court came about because he spent a lot of his time skiing at an early age, mm -hmm. but that's, that's very anecdotal. I mean, there's intuitively, you think, yeah, there's some sense to that, but, yeah. but there really is no evidence. I mean, I, I think if there is transfer between sports, there probably is, but I think it's reasonably low level by and yeah. large. Yeah. And I don't think that the, whilst the amount of transfer that occurs probably helps in your early engagement in a different sport, it wouldn't be a level of transfer that would facilitate the reaching a level of expertise within that sport. Right. I still think that it's ultimately about the specificity mm -hmm. of, of, of skill learning. And we're still, and, we're, and I think we're talking about, right. So all the strength and conditioning coaches don't get mad that this is on the technical tactical aspect, right? Certainly the work you do in the weight room on core stability is going to transfer somewhat from one sport to the other but yeah that does does pattern recognition in basketball transfer to the soccer field or or vice versa yeah. that's what we don't really know yeah yeah uh, and technical skills i mean the basic principles of transfer is that transfer is more likely to occur if the tasks share common elements mm -hmm. or similar aspects of cognitive processing mm -hmm. um and and there are some examples so there's some transfer of pattern recognition skill from field hockey to soccer for instance but yeah. not from those latter two sports to volleyball yeah and of course that's based on on principles of there being tactical similarity between field hockey and soccer and they're both invasion sports um even i believe and again i'm not a physiologist but but or a strength and conditioning guy but uh, even the uh, the science underpinning the transfer in those areas is probably not quite as strong as you think, mm. uh, and and there's a difficult balance there, I guess, between the generality of training, for instance, mm -hmm. developing basic strength or power, and the task specific nature of the manner in which those attributes are applied. Mm -hmm. You know, so the way that you strengthen power in a game it's probably very different to some degree to the way that you might develop those in the gym. Mm -hmm. So we still have the same element of transfer question, which is of course, why to some degree, uh, certainly in the premier league, um, there's been much greater efforts over the last few years to stimulate workload uh, by manipulating the constraints of small sided game. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, have, I haven't seen him work, but I believe Mourinho is a big advocate of tactical the, periodization stuff. Well, and, well yeah. doing most of his, his training stimulus through small sided games by right. manipulating the size of the area or the number of players involved. Yeah. Um, and there's certainly been made, it, really amazing examples of coaches who have managed workloads. I think you being a Welshman, I think of Craig Bellamy, right? Yeah. A, a guy who like was consistently injured and then found i think I, I don't know if it was mark hughes or whoever was at man city that kept him healthy for a while by putting him on a different program and then yeah. mancini came in and he was injured all the time again right and like you know yeah. so you know gareth bale now under Mourinho, right what's his program christian yeah. posich is his his program is clearly not going to be what everyone else's is if you're trying to keep him healthy at least at this stage you know yeah yeah so again, we're back to where we started off the <laughs> around Individual. issues of sh shades of grey as well, in the sense of you know debate around generality versus specificity of expertise and, and what, if anything, transfers and, and uh, it's amazing. Uh, well, I guess they're, they're at least questions that I guess 
are the types of questions that coaches and people interested in sport would debate about in the pub or over a cup of coffee somewhere. But I guess there are also questions that interest scientists. In the yeah. Sense of, you know, how do we collect some empirical data that might provide more guidance over the, the solutions to those kinds of questions? Yeah. Well, this is what I love about your book. And um, I, it, it makes me think of what you just said, makes me think of something that David Epstein told me. He said, I like to write books um, on subjects that people tend to talk about at parties, but they don't really have any evidence for their position. <laughs> and he goes, and so I want to give them an explanation of that. And I think this is what your book is, is like, this is something that lots of, everything we've talked about, right? Everything in your book. And and I mean, we, we're not going to have time, but I mean, other chapters of yours, the art of the con, why athletes choke, how to win a penalty shootout. These are things that coaches would talk about over a beer. Yeah, but they absolutely. don't really have a lot of evidence for why they believe what they believe. Yeah, and to some degree in the book, and, and we highlighted it at the start, the book doesn't necessarily always give answers to those questions. But what I think it does, it presents the science in a measured way and gives those coaches and those people more ammunition <laughs> to fuel the discussion and the arguments. Exactly, like take what makes the most sense to you and, 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 and build around that, but at least have your, again, to go back to your quote, at least have your art of coaching informed by something instead of just informed by, well, this is how I was coached or whatever. Yeah, yeah. 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 so. Yeah, uh, and ultimately, uh, you know, the book, as you said, I'm sure we'll produce a lot of interesting debates and discussion. But the key point for me is that that's what we actually know as far as the science is concerned. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, if nothing else, I, the science, I believe, is, is where we're at from the cutting edge perspective. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think that's yeah. a positive thing from Any my perspective. Uh I want to be respective of your time. I know you have to go teach a class here somewhat soon. Um, I mean, I, I mentioned these other parts of the book, like art mm -hmm. of the con and choking and all this other stuff. Is there anything like a, a story from the book or a topic that you touched on that really sticks out of like, ha, huh, you know, when I went into this, that's not what I was thinking I would, I, I was going to find or you know, what was one of the most interesting things that you pulled out of this that we haven't touched on yet here? Yeah, I, I mean, in many ways, I, I personally obviously find a lot of the content on the book quite fascinating. And it was an interesting process writing the book with, with Tim, to be honest, in the sense that um, the way that we typically approached it was I would probably pull together four or five thousand notes science notes mm -hmm. on uh, words of science notes on each chapter and then send them to tim and then tim would try and connect people that he could interview mm -hmm. and try and write a narrative around that and then we went back and forth on it and to some degree i contributed to the writing and added to the narrative but also tim contributed to the science i mean tim even came up with you know some science that um, i was not familiar with mm -hmm. so um but I guess, you know, for someone who's been involved in the field for 35 years, I mean, most of it I was, I was pretty familiar with. But um, uh, the chapter on, on the penalty shout to win a penalty shootout, there was certainly yeah. some new material there that, that I was less familiar with. Um, and, I mean, I really enjoyed writing all the chapters, actually. Um, well, give, the, give the one minute overview of the penalty shootout. Like, that, that's interesting to me. Yeah, well, it looks at different strategies that, um, uh, you know, teams can use in terms of penalty shootout. I mean, cl clearly we highlight research that demonstrates the ability of the goalkeeper to be able to anticipate the penalty kick mm -hmm. and, 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 and how we might train that. And then we highlight some of the strategies that can be used by penalty takers and present the data on what works, what might not work. Um and then within that, we looked at stereotypical threats, you know, the fact that England, for instance, had been so unsuccessful at penalty shootouts historically in major tournaments and the impact that that has. And um, a lot of work around sort of pre-action routines uh, and how the team could prepare collectively, you know, in the sense that the team would go and greet 
the penalty taker on his or her way back to the halfway line, having taken the penalty, irrespective of whether it was success or failure. Uh, and they would celebrate loudly after each penalty, which there's evidence to suggest that that tends to put off the other team. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, even though I guess the classic statement is that these penalty shootouts are a lottery and there's a huge element of luck. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, there's a huge amount of science that suggests how we can go about preparing for these penalty shootouts. Mm -hmm. Well, I think even... Possible. I think even the, I don't know if it's Jordi's research on, yeah. you know, whether you shoot first or, or playing to win versus yeah. playing not to lose, right? And yeah. the percentage yeah. is made when you're shooting to win versus yeah. if you miss, you're going to lose goes way down. I, I think that's fascinating when it terms, do we want to shoot first or second? <laughs> yeah, no, no, sure. And, and probably Gaer, Gaer has done more work than anybody else actually on, um, on penalty shootouts over the years, so he he uh, figures quite prominently. There's quite a few quotes from him in that that particular chapter. Yeah, um, and and, and, and that, then the oh sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and that's that's another nice thing about the book in the sense that uh, Tim obviously used his contacts to get access to a lot of elite athletes um, from the soccer side. We've got Jamie Carragher, Marcus Rashford, Harry Kane. Uh, and, and quite a few others. But then from my side, again, ob obviously I try to engage as many scientists as possible from my field. So yeah. we do get a lot of input from people like Geir and, and a number of others who are quite prominent researchers. So it kind of meshes it all together. Yeah. Quite well in my mind. And then I'll just leave people with this hint. Um, so they'll go out and get this book because I think it belongs on every coach's shelf. Um, grunting in tennis. If you want to learn about grunting in tennis, you're going to want to read the art of the con chapter. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 But, but, but I, I think I hope, well, I hope it's a book that not only appeals to coaches, but might appeal to athletes would yeah. appeal to parents for anybody who wants to have those, uh, you know, around the dinner table, in the pub, in the coffee shop, discussions around sport. And of course, you know, sport is one of our key cultures and, and what underpins a lot of our society. And I guess we noticed that quite markedly during COVID lockdown over the last few months that yeah. when we didn't have access to it, life changed quite massively. So, um, so I think the book, you need to read the book because it will make sure that you win more of those debates and discussions. Exactly. You might, get, you might get a free free beer out of the deal. Yeah. Um, awesome. The book is The Best, How Elite Athletes Are Made. Mark and Tim, um, Tim Wigmore and Mark Williams. Uh, Mark, it was awesome to have you on. Uh, we could have gone for three hours here and barely scratched the surface, but I love talking to you about this stuff. And uh, the book comes out, I believe, December 1st in the United States. So kind of that's, the day we're correct. releasing this podcast. Um, yeah. I'm going to write a little article about it as well because I enjoyed it so much. But I, I think it's a book that belongs on everyone's shelf. And I, I want to thank you for all your work in this field and, and for making the time for our conversation today. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoyed our conversation as per last time. And uh, I think your pod and your service to the field should also be credited. So great. Awesome. I, I, I enjoy, uh, enjoy listening to it. Appreciate that. Thanks so much, Mark.